All right, I hope, uh, I hope you can see me. I'm supposed to be live on the Karis Bible College uh, Facebook page, and I hope that's what's happening right now. So uh, this is my first time at this. So anyway, my name is Barry Bennett. I'm an instructor here at Karis Bible College in Colorado. And like everyone else around the world, we are in lockdown. And so I thought I would uh, take an opportunity to share a Bible study with you right now. The plan is for this to be weekly. Uh, Wednesdays at 2.30, either from here or perhaps hopefully soon back uh, up in Woodland Park. Uh, so what I want to do is take this time to answer some questions, uh, frequently asked questions, questions that are on people's hearts, and uh, see if I can help, if I can bring a little bit of light to some of these subjects that are so um, important to us, especially today in the day in which we are living. Uh, and the first question that I want to get to is about the virus, obviously. And the question is, is, is this virus from God? And we have a lot of uh, ministers uh, in the world writing or preaching or teaching or speaking about this virus and unfortunately attributing it to, to God. Uh, I've heard different perspectives on this, that God is sending it to call his church to repentance or call the world to repentance or... Uh, it's a judgment in some cases. Uh, some pronounce it as a judgment. And so I want to look at it with you in, in light of the scriptures and uh, give you a perspective that I hold to and I think uh, will be helpful to you. I want to start by reading from Luke chapter 13. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today. If you want to take some notes, that might be helpful so you can share these scriptures with other people. But in Luke chapter 13, I'm going to read from verse 1. And it says, there were present at that season uh, some that told him of the Galileans, told Jesus of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered these things. So Jesus is referring to an actual historical event in which Pilate had had some folks killed and taking their blood and put it into the sacrifices that were being offered in the temple, which obviously was quite sacrilegious and an abomination to the Jewish people. And so Jesus is wanting to know, do you think that those who suffered this were suffering this for something they did? Were they worse sinners than other people? And then he goes on to say, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then he goes on to talk about uh, another event, or those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So here he's referring to something where a building fell over and it killed 18 people. And the immediate response of most is to assume that God was judging them or God was sending some message by knocking that building over or God was judging them by having their sacrifices mingled with blood, the blood of uh, those who had perished. And Jesus is saying, no, it's nothing to do with the sin of these people. I'm going to amplify here, all right? So you can take it or leave it. But we live in a fallen world and things happen. Uh, tragedies happen, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, fires, plagues. All of these kinds of things take place in the world. But to jump to the conclusion that God is bringing judgment is the wrong conclusion. That is what Jesus is saying. These people weren't worse sinners than other people. But unless we all repent, we will all perish. In other words, the message here isn't about the people that are suffering. The message is about what is our response to the goodness of God. We know in Romans 2, 4, it says the goodness of God leads us to repentance. The goodness of God. And so with that as kind of a backdrop, I want to just go through some other scriptures with you. And I'm going to start in John 5, 22. John 5, 22, Jesus says, For the Father judges no one. The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. All right, so right off the bat, we have a conflict with a lot of teaching I've been hearing out there that God is judging when Jesus specifically said the Father is not judging. He's not judging. And I'll explain the age in which we live in just a moment. But it says he has committed all judgment to the Son. And so then some will say, well, then it must be Jesus that is doing this to us. He's, he's the one judging. He's the one sending earthquakes uh, or hurricanes or whatever. So it's Jesus must be doing this. That's the only conclusion you can come to is if the Father isn't doing it, then it must be Jesus. 
Well, let's read something else that Jesus said in John 12, 47 and 48. John 12, 47 and 48 says, And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. So Jesus is saying, even right now, if you hear me and don't believe what I'm saying, I'm not going to judge you. I am not going to judge you, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. We've got to get that grounded in our hearts, folks. That Jesus is not about judging, he's about saving. He says, he who rejects me, now he makes it more clear, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. There is something that will judge those that reject Jesus. It says, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now that's about as clear as water. The Father is not judging. He gave judgment to Jesus. Jesus says, I'm not judging, I came to save. But there is a coming judgment. Those that reject my word will be judged in the last day. And he tells you when it's going to happen. It's going to happen in the last day. It's not happening now. We're not in the last day. Now we are in the last days. We are approaching that time. But we're not in that time when men are being judged for rejecting the word of Jesus. All right, <clears throat> let's go to Romans 2.5. Romans 2.5 says, But in accordance with your hardness of heart, or excuse me, your hardness and impenitent or unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now this is Paul speaking in Romans, and he says, Because of your unrepentant heart, you're, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath. Who is he talking to? Well, I don't have time right now, but go to Romans chapter 1 verses 18 through 32, and you'll see who, who Paul is talking about. He's moving into this next chapter, chapter 2, verse 4, and he says to those people from Romans chapter 1, because of your unrepentant heart, these people had suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. They are inventors of evil. They, they, they know they're worthy of death. They hate God. Jo Jesus talked about this in John chapter 3. He said, there are those who hate the light. They hate God. They hate having their works exposed. So there's a class of people that we are referring to here for whom there is a day of wrath, the last day. That's not what's happening right now in the world, but that's what, what uh, Paul is speaking to. When Jesus was born, when Jesus came into the earth, the angels in Luke chapter 2 were singing above this, this supernatural birth, and they were saying in Luke 2.14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now that was the heart of God in sending Jesus. We just read that Jesus said, I came to save the world. And so the angels are singing peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And so we've, we've got to have this foundation of understanding the purpose of Jesus, the purpose of the gospel, before we jump to these weird conclusions about God being schizophrenic and, and the very people he says he came to save, he's also coming to kill. That, that doesn't make any sense. And so peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Listen to how Jesus started his ministry in Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 18 and 19. This should be familiar to many of you. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, to send viruses when I feel like it. No, it doesn't say that. He's, he's come to heal, to, to save, to lift up, to bless people. And he goes on to say, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Folks, that is the year that we are living in, the, the year of the Lord. A year is as a thousand, or a day is as a thousand years, and all of that, I don't know, but... Right now, we are living in this time of grace, the acceptable year of the Lord. Hebrews 4 calls it the today of salvation. We are living in this era in which goodwill toward men is the message. And Jesus came to bring life, to bring love, to bring healing, to re restore, to reconcile. And so it's, it's inconsistent with the idea that he is simultaneously sending viruses to kill people indiscriminately. Uh, the wrath of God is going to be much more precise than the viruses of, of the evil one. Jesus was quoting from Isaiah 61. He says, the Lord has anointed me to heal. In Isaiah 61, verse 2, 
Jesus in Luke 4.19 said to pro proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He's getting that from Isaiah 61 verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stopped. He did not continue with what is in Isaiah. And the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus stopped on purpose when he quoted it because he was preaching the acceptable year of the Lord. The day of vengeance of our God is to come. That will come for those that hate him, for those that are storing up wrath for themselves for the day of wrath. We are not in that time period right now. John 3.16 yeah, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Folks, the most famous verse in the Bible is also one of the clearest. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. Now listen, if, if God were to say, or if I were to say, I love you, and then I send a virus to your house, do you see some inconsistency there? I do. When God says, for he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and oh, by the way, here's a virus, just in case you don't understand. No, I'm sorry. I, I can't go there. That, that just simply is not right. We are in the today of salvation, the acceptable year of the Lord, the age of grace, goodwill toward men. Let me make it even more clear. Go with me to 2 Corinthians 5.19. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Listen very carefully not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of, not judgment, the word of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing sins unto us. Now those that preach that this virus is a judgment of God, or that earthquakes are a judgment of God, or knocking down two buildings on 9-11 is the judgment of God, they don't understand the gospel. Because what they are saying is a direct contradiction to what the Word of God is saying. The Word of God says he is not imputing sins. These preachers and teachers are saying he is imputing sin. He is judging now. And I'm going to have to say, no, he's not. The Father judges no man. He gave it to the Son. The Son says, I'm not judging. I came to save. Praise God. He says, but the Word, anyone that rejects my Word, will be judged in the last day. And Paul goes on in Romans 1, 18 through 32 to explain who those people are. And then in Romans 2, 4, he says, you're storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath. So there is a coming day of wrath, but we're not in that time right now. What we are in is a fallen world. Sin has done such damage to humanity, to creation itself. Viruses are just simply a perversion that sin has not, I won't say sin has created, but the, the perversion that sin has had on even the DNA of humans, even the, 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 the makeup of plants and animals, everything has been perverted by sin. And so viruses are just an extension of that, but they're not from God. They are from the, from the enemy or from man's own consequences of, of man's sin. All right, let's go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. It says, Go therefore, and this is Jesus speaking to the church, to the disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, listen, even to the end of the age. Or in other words, this commission is valid till the end of the age. I think most of us would agree we should be out preaching the gospel to the world. And the gospel is good news. And he says, I want this done until the end of the age. I'm going to be with you in this mission until the end of the age. Well, then it's inconsistent to say that the same Jesus that wants his church to go out preaching good news of the love of God, of the acceptable year of the Lord, of the today of salvation, we're going to be preaching that message. But simultaneously, God is out there killing people, judging them, wiping out regions and nations and sending viruses around the world. I'm sorry, that is, that's not the gospel. That is completely inconsistent with the nature of God. We have got to get, 
a, a revelation of the love of God for humanity. God doesn't hate the lost. You were lost once. I was lost once. God does not hate us. Why do we get self-inflated and think that now that we're saved, God hates the other lost and he's willing to kill them? Or he's even killing Christians. Christians are dying from this virus. Is that the will of God? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so there's just a lot of bad teaching floating around out there. And we've got to get grounded in what the word, the revelation of Jesus to us actually means. Okay, so question. And I have a few questions here to ask you. What age are we in? Are we still in the age of preaching the gospel or have we changed ages? What age are, are we in now? Are we in an age of wrath? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Uh, isn't the gospel good news? Absolutely, it's good news. Isn't it a word of reconciliation? Isn't it a word of peace on earth, goodwill toward men? Isn't it a word of him not imputing sins unto us, giving us this time of grace in which we can hear, and the goodness of God causes us to repent? Not the wrath of God, not the viruses. Not the, People say, well, the virus will cause people to repent. Maybe. There's a lot of things that wake people up. It's not that God sent that thing or God is using that thing. It's that some things just wake people up. The prodigal son, God didn't send him to live with pigs, but living with pigs woke him up. It wasn't God that was doing that to him. He did it to himself. And so a lot of things going on in the world may wake you up and you may repent. Praise God. But that you're going to turn to the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that's going to draw you, not... If you're, if you're just living in fear, then that's not going to be a repentance that's going to bring life to you. It's the goodness of God that's going to bring you into a place of salvation. Uh, when he sends the church into the whole world to preach the good news, why doesn't he say, and I'm going to also send a few viruses out there with you, just in case they don't get it? Now, I'm being silly, but I want you to understand that this is a crazy doctrine that is being taught that God is judging the world with viruses, or God allowed the virus. Uh, I have a whole lot to say about that, but allow means to give permission. And God did not give permission. God didn't give permission in the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He forbade them from eating from that tree. He gave them permission to eat from every other tree in the garden. He gave them permission to eat from the tree of life. That's what he gave them permission to do. He did not give permission. He did not allow them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is where all evil came from. I say there, there's a lot there. So when people say, well, God allowed it. No, he did not. He did not allow it. It is a result of sin in the earth and what sin has done to the earth itself, what sin has done to the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the human race. What sin has done is why we have viruses and every other plague and, and suffering in the world. It's not God that is doing that. What God has allowed after sending Jesus to reconcile the world unto himself and not impute our sins unto us, what God has allowed is for us to get born again, for us to believe the gospel. God has allowed for us to carry his name, the name above all names. God has allowed for us to be filled with his spirit. God has allowed for us to be washed in his blood. God has allowed for us to be a part of his covenant family. God has allowed for us to have the gifts of the Spirit. God has allowed us to have all the promises of God that are yes and amen. God has allowed us to wear the armor of God. God has given us the keys to the kingdom. That's what God has allowed. And that's where much, much of the church is absolutely ignorant of these things. God has given us permission to walk in his name and his authority and his faith, faith and bring healing to this world. That's what we should be about. And to say, well, God is using this virus or sending this virus or allowed this virus or whatever, is just nuts. I, it's simply not the gospel. If the virus is from God, what right then do we have to speak against it? If you know, a, if you know someone that has this virus and you think or someone has told you that this may be from God, then you have absolutely no right to pray against it. You have no right to lay hands on the sick. You just simply are, are you got to let it do what it's going to do. Because if it's from God and you're fighting it, then you're in rebellion. Right? And that would be the same for the whole subject of sickness. We are called to bring healing just as Jesus did, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. We, it, 
a virus, I tell you, if I come across someone with this virus, I'm going to pray for them. I have no doubt in my mind it's not God. It's not God judging them. He's not imputing sins. It's not his wrath. We're not in that day. We're in the day of salvation. And so it, you, you can't be consistent with this theology and pray to God to heal someone that you also believe is suffering something that God allowed or God sent. That's crazy. If God is allowing the virus, it means his nature has changed. What is the nature of God? The, the nature of God never changed. Man changed. God has never changed. The nature of God is that James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above that comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Praise God. That's the nature of God. Every good gift. When God was done with creation on the sixth day, it says he looked at everything he had created and behold, it was very good. There was no sin. There was no death. There was no sickness. There were no earthquakes. There was no tragedy. There was no suffering. It was very good. That's what God made. And now, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you're born again, you are a new creation, created in righteousness. It's very good. It's very good. And so we, we have to understand the nature of God hasn't changed. Sin changed everything God made, but God is redeeming it. Jesus came to redeem, to reconcile, to restore. And those of us that walk by faith can walk in this authority. We can walk in this blessing, in this gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 8. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. This one verse right here destroys this whole thing of, of God is doing this, God is in control, God is allowing it, God sent it. No, there's a devil. There's four things you can learn from this little part of half second half of this verse. Let me read it to you again. It says, For this purpose was the Son of God manifested. So there's the purpose. I teach this in school, the law of purpose. Everything that God created has a purpose. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, let's, let's look at what are four things that we can pull from this. Number one, there's a devil. There is a devil. Number two, he has works. So something the devil is doing, he, he's able to accomplish his works. Number three, his works are worthy of destruction. And number four, Jesus came to destroy them. So my question is to people that, that say the virus is from God, well, what's from the devil? Is the devil on vacation on the beach? Beaches are empty right now. I guess that's where the devil could be. Uh, the devil has works, folks. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now let's look at what the virus is doing. It is stealing our economy. It is killing people, and it is destroying lives and businesses and families. That isn't God. He didn't allow it. He's not using it. He doesn't want it. He's given us, the church, the authority to speak against it, to stand against it in faith. But if we have been polluted with bad teaching that, well, maybe this is from God, and so many Christians are in that place right now battling, they think, well, maybe God wants to do this, that theology paralyzes the church. It puts us in a place of passivity, and it redefines faith as fate. Fate is not faith. And people that just sit back and say, whatever will be, will be, and the famous cliches, well, God's in control, or God's got this, or God, everything will be okay, that's all baloney. No, God is not in control. He can't even control you. You need to have influence in your life, in your sphere. You need to stand up. I need to stand up. We need to proclaim the goodness of God, the gospel of God. We need to take the, the shield of faith. We need to take the sword of the Spirit. We need to take the name of Jesus, the, the gifts of the Spirit, everything that has been given to us, and we need to make a stand as Christians and quit blaming God for what the enemy is doing. Amen. Let me read a couple more scriptures, and I'll sign off with you for today. In John 20, 21, Jesus said, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Jesus went about, Acts 10, 38. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the enemy. And then he turns around and says, As the Father sent me, so send I you. And he had said earlier in Matthew 28, I'm with you till the end of the age. And we're in this age of salvation. 
We're in this age of grace. And as he sent Jesus, he sends us. We are the answer. Quit looking to God. God, do something. No, God is looking to us. I have filled you with my spirit. Do something. Speak. Act. Take this gospel. Quit believing the lies of the enemy. As he sent Jesus, he has sent us. John 10, 10 again, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. God wants you to have life. He wants you to finish your course. He wants you to have abundant life. He wants you to be a carrier of life. He wants you to bring life to people that are suffering. He wants you to bring light and understanding to people that are, are struggling with these questions. Jesus is all about saving the world, not about destroying the world. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians are playing for the wrong team. That's, that's sad to say. Viruses are a part of fallen nature, a result of sin in the earth. They come to steal, kill, and destroy. They're not from God. They're not from God. The gospel is from God. The power to heal is from God. The power to lift up and to set people free, that's from God. And that's what we need to be about as a church. Praise God. If, if uh, you have a need for prayer uh, or counsel or some, some kind of question that you might have, you can call our prayer line at Andrew Womack Ministries. The number is 719-635-1111. Call that number, 719-635-1111. And you can get prayer right now if you want to talk about some of the things I've said. If you have a question you can put it in the comments. I see a lot of comments popping up right now. I'm not going to do live questions in this study. I'll probably do one question a week. But uh, give me your feedback and we'll see what we look at next week. I want this to be a blessing to you and I want to clear away some of the, the bad teaching that is out there. So thank you for tuning in. Thanks for watching today. Uh, God bless you and we'll see you next time. Amen. If I can figure out how to turn this off.